Hi, it's Phil Kerner, the Tool and Die Guy. And uh, usually when I'm on this site showing a video, I'm usually talking about tool and die making or machining, something like that. Well, an interesting thing has been coming up for me. And over the years, I, I post once in a while some vintage drawings. And the past 10 days or so, I've started to post some of my own work that I did as a draftsman many years ago. I am quite shocked on one level that there is so much interest in these drawings and how to make them. So I started to think about that, but there is a resurgence in um, working with your hands because learning how to draw, it makes you an artist. And let's make no mistake about it, mechanical drafting is an art. And what we learned back in those days, uh, I still use today when I use AutoCAD. And the process of spending hours back in those days over a drawing, you knew that part intimately well. Now again, I use AutoCAD every day and I can do it so much faster, but the drawings don't have that personality. And we'll go over that in this class, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. So with all the interest here, I thought, what the heck? I'm pretty good at it. People seem to be interested. So we're gonna do the art of mechanical drafting. And it is an art. And uh, the difference between um, an artist class, which is great, I, I, I've taken them. Um, I like uh, sketching uh, buildings and architecture for some reason. But, and mechanical drafting is the things we draw in mechanical drafting are going to actually be built, okay? And uh, your job as a mechanical drafter is to convey your information accurately to the shop floor or to the engineering department, but usually the tool maker like me or the machinist who's got to build that part. And there's an art to showing that in a way that he or she will understand what you want. All right, so that's the part I think AutoCAD misses today. And I think everybody who goes through design uh, school today should learn six months of mechanical drafting. And maybe they'll use this class, I don't know. So uh, I haven't done this for years. I was able to buy back, and I might repeat myself a few times during this video. Uh, I had this beautiful old uh, drawing board I sold a couple years ago, and this guy got sick of it, so I bought it back for the same price. So I've got all my stuff from 1978, and uh, most of it. Once in a while they hear me say, yeah, I used to have this. But I'm gonna teach you what goes into a drawing because you're, this stuff matters. They're gonna build parts to what you're designing here, okay? They're gonna machine parts to what you're designing. So besides the dimensioning being right, what I love to teach too is the artist part, which is making the drawing stand out. What kind of lettering to use? It, there's all sorts of techniques with the pencils and leads and all the stuff you're going to use. And it's a fun hobby. Unlike tool and die making where you'll end up with thousands and thousands of dollars worth of tools in your toolbox by the end of your career, like me, uh, in this particular venue, uh, a couple hundred bucks will get you set up pretty well. And it's a really fun thing to learn. So I always like to say, as a teacher, I like to start with the end in mind. If I'm gonna teach a, you how to draw a building, I'm gonna take you to a building and show you this is what I had in mind. And then when I teach you how to use a drill and a saw, you're gonna say, oh, you know, instead of saying, why am I drilling this hole? Why am I sawing these boards? You'll have a picture in your head. I know where I wanna get, this building. Well, so I'm gonna show you some vintage drawings that. Um, I was lucky enough to not only work under a master and then learn and do them myself. So this should be a fun class. And again, it's a little off subject for me, but since I have all the equipment and there seems to be a lot of interest, let's get it started. So again, starting with the end in mind, uh, this is a beautiful old blueprint, uh, which is a copy of the original drawing. And back in the day before they had plotters, the, what you would do is draw this on white paper, almost like we used to call tracing paper. The official name was tracing vellum, okay? And I think you could still buy tracing vellum. And then you would run the vellum through with this type of paper through a blueprint machine. And it would uh, it had ammonia in it, lots of ammonia, kind of gas out the drafting room. But uh, this was done by a fellow named Norman Reitman at the R.M. Kerner Company back in 1978. And this is just a basic layout for a, um, some sort of a machine he was designing. But, you know, again, you talk about a beautiful, uh, this guy was not just a terrific designer and a terrific draftsman. His presentations were flawless. The, the time he spent to go through and put these section lines and, 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 and shade these uh, shafts so you could tell they were round. This is where you'd eventually want to get. And the shading is an art. Uh, I'm still okay at it, um, but uh, it's a, uh, this is where you want to eventually get to. Well, 
Again, these are very fragile. I actually have a copy of this uh, at the toolanddieguy.com. You can actually buy a copy of this. I preserved it digitally. If you want to hang it, it's for some inspiration, as I do. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is this book. And this is the book I had from high school, from the Erie County Technical School, The Fundamentals of Engineering Drawing. And we're going to probably use this a little bit as a guide. It was made in 1960, I believe. But they're going to teach you how to do your lettering. And they're going to teach you uh, uh, how to use compasses. And, of course, I'm going to teach you that, too, and your T-square practices. And it shows you all the different combinations you can use to get different angles and a little bit of geometry and a lot of it on lettering. Uh, lettering is how you add personality to your drawings, which you don't get with AutoCAD. And of course, you know, you, there's, there are lettering templates and everything. I never got into those too much. I think the, the place to do those, they're very time consuming, might be on your title block, and we'll get into that too, but they show you how to do your strokes, which way to go to make all your letters. And then we get into some different uh, views and how to draw different views. And uh, finally, another big resource I'll probably be using because you can learn just like I did from Mr. Tulio. And this is full of my red check marks from Mr. Tulio, so I'm going to bare my soul here. Let's see, it's upside down. Phil Kerner, okay. And basically what they started us with was uh, just learning how to draw some basic lines. And uh, it's interesting to watch this is a little advanced. That was a final test. I don't know why that's in the front. But just to learn how to draw different angled and vertical lines. And this was a, there's a, I'm sure in this book I just showed you, it told me how long each line had to be, what angle, and I'm sure this was all done with those triangles I showed you. I'm not going to bore you with the whole book, but there you go. That's how you practice lettering and good at it, okay? Uh, there's your uh, vertical incline. I would call italicized, but I only get an 80% on that. Need some more space between the lines, okay? But uh, you know, I think I was falling asleep then, learning how to do your numbers, all right? And then as you get better and better through your classes, uh, we had to prove our math out for uh, certain problems, but this is what you learn how to do, or drawings like this, all right? And it progresses, and uh, this is some sketching. We learned how to hand sketch things. Yeah, and he, he, he put a lot of red marks. And again, to give this guy credit, there's probably 20 kids in the class, and he checked every one of these drawings. And, and he, he would mark where I missed, but his whole thing was see it, See it? See it? That was Mr. Tolio. So I'm going to show you can say that a lot while I'm teaching you guys. See it? See it? Kind of drove you nuts after a while. Hopefully it doesn't drive you too nuts. So anyways, that's another source of reference. Uh, this is a nice one. And you know what? I'll probably make some copies of these and download. You can download them as PDFs, okay? But uh, different types of lines. Not only did I have to do this for an exercise, but I was learning how to draw different types of lines. And that'll be another lesson. Um, uh, cutting planes and uh, visible outlines are nice and dark so your parts stand out from the drawing and then uh, your dotted lines, um, hidden lines, center lines, extension lines, but that's what you use your different pencils for, your different lead weights for, okay? So um, that's uh, that. So let's uh, talk about some of the tools of the trade. So this is my setup right now, and this is a beautiful old uh, Mayline drafting table. I'm going to guess by the way it was built, probably a 1950s, 1960s vintage. Now we'll get to this drafting machine up here in a second, uh, but, but you're, most of you will start off with and how I started, uh, probably in ninth or 10th grade with my, ninth grade with my first drafting class, was either a T-square on a drafting table that you would hold up against the left edge, and um, the trick with the T-square, of course, is to hold it in place while you're using um, triangles right, that are right angles to make your straight lines. You'll use the um, straight edge of your T-square to make your horizontal lines, but then you're going to use different triangles like this to draw your vertical lines. And the two most popular triangles that we were always issued was what we would call a 45 degree triangle in a 30 degree triangle and there's a reason for that but uh, we'll, that's it. Uh, we'll get into that. Now what's set up on this particular table is something that would be the next step up from the T-square and again it's a bit of a challenge to get used to the T-square because you've got to hold it in place against the left side of the table while you're holding this and drawing a line. You get the hang of it but it's a little tougher and plus with no graduations on the uh, measurement on the sides of these T-squares you've got to uh, 
mark your lines with some sort of a ruler too. So it's a bit cumbersome. And the trick here is I have a saying in the tool and die world that anybody can do anything if you give them way too long to do it. So what they were trying to teach us in drafting and design class those, all those years ago was as you learn the techniques to start speeding it up, okay, and pump those drawings out. Well, this is obviously a very slow process. Now, if you're just starting out, I get it. You're not going to spend a ton of money on this stuff. But <clears throat> the next step up from the uh, T-square would be the straight edge. And uh, it's a story about this table is it was from my shop, and I, I had it for years, and I sold it to an apprentice at work a couple years ago, and he couldn't deal with it anymore because it's so big. <laughs> so he put it away, and then this class came up, I said, you know what, I'll buy it back from you. So a couple things about this table. It came equipped with a lovely uh, straight edge. Now the way in a perfect world the straight edge works, there's a series of cables that run through this, the whole length of this, go around the table, I don't know why when I get a little close it freaks out there. It goes around the table and this goes perfectly, follows it up and down straight. Well, as you can see, the cables aren't there, so it's not doing that. Well, I started looking at trying to put it back together and it turned into a bit of a Rubik's Cube that I didn't feel like dealing with. So, um, and especially since I'm not going to be using it for these lessons, it just wasn't worth the time. Eventually, I'll figure out how to put it back together, but I think I'm going to have to take all the screws out of the face of this and loop the cable back through. But for you guys and gals out there that don't want to go the T-square route and have to deal with triangles and have to deal with a, a scale like this, this is your, well, you probably still need these for your vertical lines, my mistake, but at least it saves you time from having to hold a T-square against the side. So this is called a straight edge. And again, in a perfect world, if the cables are set correctly, this goes up and down perfectly straight. And it's a big time saver. It's the next evolution from going from the T-square. The next thing is, of course, the straight edge. And uh, again, sometime when I have some time, I'll maybe I'll take this thing apart and figure out how to put it back together. So, but that is the, uh, that is the straight edge. Now, the next step, evolution, is to get yourself a little drafting machine. And uh, I will look this up and see how much these cost. But as you can see here, uh, this is a, an old Vemco uh, drafting machine. It's got the scales already attached to it, so I don't need a roller, it's built in. I've got my right angles here, but the beautiful part about this is by pressing this button here, I can turn this to any angle I want, and it locks in at every 15 degrees. So there's 30, 45, really big time saver. Now if you want to hit an odd degree like seven, there's a scale, and I'll zoom in on this in a second, but I can set this to seven degrees and then just lock the head and that's seven degrees, okay? So this is the where you want to get if you're going to take this seriously. I don't know how far you want to take it, but uh, the drafting machine, uh, we used to call this a knuckle type. As you can see, it's got a, a knuckle up here in the corner, and that's uh, just simply clamped to the top of the table up here. But uh, I was glad to get this back. It's an oldie but goodie. So let's uh, zoom in on the drafting head here. I'll show you a little bit about how this works. It's a nice piece of equipment. And uh, let me refocus the camera. So this is the actual head on these, uh, this Vemco uh, drawing machine, drafting machine. And as you can see here, uh, we've got the scale of degrees all the way around the head. And then we've got this other scale here. And uh, this is a, a, actually a vernier for uh, setting very accurate degrees. And uh, we're not going to get quite into that. I've never used this in my life in drafting, okay? So anyways, it's set at zero now. So basically the way this works is we're going to press this button in and release it. It's going to lock at 15, press it, release it. It's going to lock at 30, and so on and so on, every 15 degrees. If I press it in and hold it up, it locks in a different position. Now it's just free turning, any angle you want. So again, as I said, if I want to set this at 5 degrees, I line the 0 and the 5 up and then lock this. And now we're at 5 degrees. So this is a really nice addition. Uh, I'll check it out online to see what's available. And uh, gotta let that go. So it snaps back in. I'll just pop in every 15 degrees. And I, and I said, as I said, if it gets locked up, it'll just it'll just spin wildly free. Okay, it just wants to be free, but we don't want it to be free. We want it to pop back in every. 15 degrees, and there you go. So that's the Vemco drafting head. Wonderful invention, a big time saver, much faster 
uh, and more efficient than a straight edge or a T-square. So next up is this um, draftsman's scale, all right? As you can see, it's triangular shaped and that's got several different scales on it and different uh, for drawing two to one drawings by, by the foot. It's got a lot going on, okay? But uh, you can pick these up. They're pretty cool. They're made out of aluminum and they're coated. So they're, they have a nice strong feel to them. But as you can see, there's a lot of different scales on here depending on what uh, you're working on. But this is a nice way to start and they sit very flat and, and you can draw a nice sharp line. Again, this isn't a sketching class. This is a precision mechanical drafting class. So uh, the better tools you buy, just like in the trade I'm in, uh, tool making, the better tools I have, the better work I can do, okay? So as I said uh, before, this particular hobby, except for the expense of getting a drawing board, the rest of the stuff is peanuts compared to being a machinist or a toolmaker, okay? So you're going to need a good scale. Then we'll move on to these triangles, because if you're going to do straight edge work or work with um, uh, a T-square. And I've had these a long time, and let's see who made these. Dietzen. Remember I told you you'd see that name? Let's see if I could focus in on that a little bit. Let's see here. Yeah, Dietzen. And uh, they're nice, strong, um, pliable plastic. Now, I've had some triangles in the past. I don't know how I ended up with them, but they're more of a plexiglass, and they both cracked. These have been around. I've had these for over 40 years. <laughs> Not too bad, right? And you can see I can bend them pretty easily, and they don't... Um, they don't break. And back then, these were so valuable, it looks like I actually uh, scratched my name in there. So, didn't want to lose these. I'm surprised I still have them. And then, uh, after we get through with the triangles, so you've got a straight edge and your triangles and a scale or ruler, the next thing we need to talk about are your pencils. So, let's get into that next. So, now we've got our drafting board set up. We've got a straight edge or a drafting machine, and now we need something to draw with. So, what we're going to use are these pencils, okay? Big shock there, right? Now, before I get into these pencils, which are all graphite, uh, we don't use charcoal. Charcoal would make a real mess, and I'll explain it to you in a minute, but we use pencils. Now, if you're really serious about this, what you would do is uh, get yourself one of these. Now, it looks like a mechanical pencil, but it's actually called a lead holder, and it holds different leads, and as you progress, you end up with two or three different pencils, each with a different lead, depending on how uh, your line type is, and we're going to get into line types, but obviously for a heavy dark line, you would use a certain type of lead, and for a medium line, a different type of lead, and for a very thin line, another type of lead. So I only have one of these now that I can find. At the, there was a day when I had several of these with different uh, lead types in them. Now how does this work? Well, it's called a lead holder because you buy your lead in these packages, and these are called turquoise eagle uh, leads and then you can see these are all H, grade H. Now, doing a little research on these, I remember the pencils I used to use were H, 2H, and 5H were my three most popular. The more numbers after or before the H, the harder the pencil. So H is pretty soft, which would be ideal for uh, heavy dark lines. 2H would be kind of a medium and 5H would be very uh, sharp and very light. Very, uh, it would be a very light line. And uh, just as a quick tip here, and we'll probably talk about this later, a uh, 5H uh, lead will absolutely uh, uh, very hard to erase because it really puts a sharp point into your uh, into your your paper. Okay, and we're always thinking about uh, er erasing here because when we make mistakes, that's why draftsmen usually don't draw in pen. And it's not because we're afraid of making mistakes. Sometimes the customer comes back and wants a change. And you're not going to do that if it's done in pen. So uh, racing is a big deal. But anyways, let's go back to some pencils you can actually use. Oh, before I do that, by the way, uh, these need sharpened. And to sharpen your lead holding holder uh, instrument here, you get one of these very cool ones. Now, this is an old one. This is actually uh, uh, aluminum, so it's got some weight to it, and it's got a foam ring around it. So how does that work? Well, what we're going to do is stick the pencil in, so you can see this and rotate it. It's got a piece of sand, round sandpaper in it. And you can get this thing pretty sharp. And then it's got dust all over it, so you poke it in the foam to get rid of the dust because dust is your main enemy as a draftsman or a draftsperson, I guess I should say, because it starts smearing your drawing. If your hands start to sweat a little bit, you end up with a real mess. So 
uh, we've got some pencils now to look at. So in lieu of buying a bunch of lead holders and turquoise lead packs, what you can do is just get some standard pencils, okay? And you can get these at any craft store. And again, uh, uh, this one's a, a 2B. Uh, I've learned that the um, B is soft, and, and the more letters and numbers in front of that B, 2B, it's a pretty soft pencil, okay? But then, I've got this pencil here. Okay, so this is a 4B, which is going to be softer than the 2B. Then uh, 4B... 4B, don't have a big selection here. What's this one? 2B and 4B. So I've only got basically two grades, even though I've got four pencils here, okay? But between the two, the, those two grades, we'll be fine. Again, you can get these at any uh, craft store, hobby, lobby, art store. Uh, again, you just don't want charcoal pencils. You want uh, these uh, just definitely graphite or lead pencils, okay? Uh, the charcoal would make a mess. And finally, now we have some pencils, we have a pencil sharpener, and of course for these you can just use any pencil sharpener. You don't have to get too uh, fancy with the pencil sharpener, right? I have an electric one here, but I still like using pencils. You're going to need a nice uh, soft eraser. I prefer these uh, nice magic rubs. They erase beautifully and they don't mark up your paper. They're very soft. That's, that's very nice about those. And I know some of this seems ridiculous, but these are all the t tools of the trade that you're going to need. And then, after the pencil, you're going to need a drafting brush. Because after you erase, you've got to get rid of the, the shavings from the eraser. And again, this is just part of the, you don't want to do it with your hand. Because if there is any graphite dust on it, you're going to end up smearing that into your, your um, drawing, okay? So you end, up, now you end up doing this a lot. It's a constant habit when you're drawing. Now, this particular brush is a horsehair brush. I saw one like it, just like this on eBay, except it's got the handle still on it. This is actually a gift from my, uh, my teacher back in uh, 1978 when I graduated. He gave me his horsehair brush, uh, Mr. Tulio. He was a uh, designer at the General Electric plant here in Erie, Pennsylvania before he went into teaching. So. Uh, I've always enjoyed having this. It's just a really beautiful brush, and I'll put the link up for the one that's on eBay for about 12 bucks, and uh, you probably should get it. It's really nice, but you need you need a brush, constantly brushing off your drawing. So if we were to get into a few advanced things to draw circles, well, you got a couple choices with the circles, okay? A couple choices with the circles. The compass. All right, that's a small one. And if you want to draw bigger ones, Let's see here. You get a bigger one. And I see, I see these on eBay also. And of course, throughout the class, we're going to learn how to set a compass accurately and uh, draw uh, circles. All right. Now, the, the, the uh, trick to avoiding a compass, of course, is this the circle template. All right, and uh, I've got several circle templates here. Let's see, what do I have here? Well, some minute up at work. <laughs> That's the problem. Apparently, right now, I've just got this one. And these, because this the smallest circle is still pretty large. So I have another one at work that I use that gets very small. So these are available. You can buy these online. Again, now we're into stuff that's really not that expensive. One thing I will say it was fairly expensive that I was looking up. Uh, I uh, was trying to draw uh, a uh, what we would call an isometric drawing, these ellipse templates. And again, we'll get into all this, but templates are a big deal. Now, here's the issue with circle templates, though. And we'll see this in the class. Big time saver, okay? It's got, a, it's got center marks on it, so you would, you would lightly draw your center marks on your drawing and then just line this up and draw your circle. Nice. The issue is, what if you want to draw another circle inside this circle only... Uh, you know, a sixteenth of a way, of an inch away. Well, that's when your drawing turns into a mess. That's why a compass is better for double circles because it's very hard to get these perfectly lined up on the same center line. And and at that distance, a sixteenth, if you're off at all, it, it looks like they're way off. Okay, so you won't get that with a compass. But for most of your circles, the circle template's the way to go. So that gives you a really good overview of the basic equipment that we're going to use to get started. Um, I'm well aware that a lot of you guys aren't going to invest in a drafting machine, but what we can do is I will occasionally set this, like I'm using a straight edge or a T-square, to show you how to use uh, your triangles 
to draw vertical lines and measure them correctly. Uh, you, you know, if you go like this or 45 degrees, you can get different angles by putting these together, uh, right? So if we can put the 30 here and there, now we've got uh, 15 here. So there's ways to work around these for common angles uh, to use these two triangles. That's why everybody ends up with the 30 degree triangle and the 45 degree triangle. So uh, that pretty much covers, oh, one other thing. Going through my bag of goodies off camera here. And there's a lot more, but this is the basics. You're gonna need this, very important. Scotch drafting tape. And it's pretty cool. The reason it's still in the uh, roll here is it's thin. You can see it's only uh, about a half inch wide, but it's got a, a cutter on the side. So when you're taking this out, you can just take your piece out and cut it and put it on your drawing to hold it to the board. Now, the difference between this and scotch tape or any other tape you would use, it's drafting tape. It's meant to peel off and not rip your drawing, all right? Very important. And I reuse this stuff sometimes, but uh, it's not that expensive. And again, this is what you're looking for. Scotch drafting tape. It doesn't get much plainer than that. Uh, and it's the, you have to have it. It's one of the essentials, okay? So I think we could start with some lessons here um, doing our first drawing. We've got everything we need. We've got some pencils. We've got a drafting board. We've got a triangle or two. We've got some circle templates, a few compasses, and there's even an art to sharpening the lead on your compass, okay? And I'll show you how to do that too. So uh, with that being said, you need to get busy on your shopping list. The uh, most thing you're going to spend money on is the board, but uh, that should take care of it. Um, one thing I did notice, and this might happen once in a while, is I did not explain to you um, this drafting board, this green rubberish covering, okay? And I, I can put a link up for that too. I think it's called Vico. It, um, it's about an eighth inch thick. This particular one, it's a tan on the, on, the, on the reverse side, and I flipped it over, and it's like mint condition. Now, the reason you use this is if you're going to use a compass, and if you really think about this, this will make sense. You're going to be sticking this needle point into your board to draw your circle. Now, if you were just doing this on a wooden board, all right, it's going to put a hole in your board. Well, after a while, you're going to get a bunch of holes in your board, and someday you're going to be drawing a line, and your pencil's going to dig right in, all right? They're going to make a mess out of your drawing. So that's the reason you put this covering on your board. I don't care if it's just a small board. They sell, they sell this stuff, and uh, it's self-healing. So as you, when you draw a circle and pop this back out, there is no hole there. It's gone. So it, it closes back up, and if you're drawing a line, it won't, your pencil won't hit that divot. So I hope that makes sense. I did not cover that in the drawing board part of this. So it, yes, it's very important that you do have some sort of a covering on your board. Maybe you're saying, if I'm just getting started, I don't, probably don't. And as long as you don't use a compass, use your circle template, all right? So that's it for now. I think you've got enough information to choke a horse. Uh, I hope that you found this informative. Uh, some tools of the trade, as I said before. Um, you know, this is a lot cheaper than getting into uh, machining or tool making. Your biggest expense, of course, is gonna be uh, getting yourself a board. And uh, you don't need one that's nice. Uh, if you can find one, I'm sure these things have been thrown out all over the country. I couldn't give this away basically two or three years ago. Uh, I sold it and got it back for a hundred bucks. So uh, good deal. I mean, I'm seeing these drafting machines alone on uh, eBay for hundreds and hundreds of dollars, but you know, you might luck out. So um, I'm Phil Kerner, the tool and die guy. Hope you enjoyed class number one of mechanical drafting.